I'm turning the water away from the source. All right, we're going to get started. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you for coming out early. Um, hope you enjoy your Katsukon, and I hope that you get something out of this panel that, you know, stays with you or makes you think. Um, my name is Kai Anderson, uh, but on the internet I go by Clear and Sweet, and I'm a member of the True Anime community. What we do is really think critically about anime. Um, I've got thoughts on a lot of things. Um, but it's mostly magical girls and mostly themes, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, man, I've been watching, I've been a fan of the magical girl genre since, you know, growing up with Sailor Moon, and then as an adult came back to it and said, why, why do I still like this as an adult? And what makes it, you know, something transcendent or something more than just like Power Rangers or one of the other shows from my childhood that I forgot about? And uh, watching more of the genre and thinking harder and harder on it, um, man, I think we need to talk more about Madoka Magica. And it's pretty funny because I personally have talked Madoka Magica to death. I've written essays, I've done videos, I've thought about it so much, but I think we still need to talk about it even more. And <laughs> the, way, the way, you know, we're kind of thinking about Madoka Magica, I think it's time finally, to talk about the wake of Madoka Magica and everything that's kind of happened since 2011 and since the success of Madoka Magica. And, uh, man, it's been tough being a, being a fan of traditional magical girl shows. Um, but I guess it'd be easier to show you, so let's start off with a clip here. That show's called Daybreak Illusion. It aired in 2013. I don't imagine many of you have seen it. You probably shouldn't have. It's not a very good show. By any stretch of the, imagination. Um, the reviews called it try hard and surface level. And really, the only thing that really makes it relevant is that it's the first in the kind of wake of Madoka Magica capitalizing on what we know as the dark magical girl genre. Um, we've got more more clips from more shows later on. But first we've got to talk about Madoka. Uh, before we talk about why Madoka Magica was successful at what it aimed to do, we have to talk about how it was successful, or how successful was it. And it's important to understand how things became the way they are. This is a graph taken from the wiki. Um, for when Madoka Magica aired, the Blu-ray sales were the second highest out of any late night anime television show. And this is back from 2011, and I'm sure it's a little out of date now, but this type of success, this type of success, and also, you know, a lot of money comes from merchandising, and if you get your shirt in Hot Topic, you know, you've, you've entered the mainstream, you know, zeitgeist in a way that people are going to want to emulate, right? Uh, and especially the production committees that greenlight animes to be made. 
So here's another one from when I was in uh, Tokyo, and this is a shopping mall, the Looming Man shopping mall with Madoka Magica characters advertising it. Because I, I don't know how they relate to the shopping mall, but they're just, you just put popular stuff on there. And in that way, it's kind of like, it kind of penetrated the regular people sphere or the anime fan at large sphere in a way that really genre shows don't. Uh, kind of like you think about Evangelion and how, you know, you see all those stuff, so the shaving with Gendo shaving and stuff, and you're like, what, what is this? And it, Madoka Magica was kind of in that same vein of this became insanely popular outside of its intended sphere of audience. And it got a lot of praise for doing the same thing, or doing in the same vein as Evangelion, for deconstructing and revolutionizing a genre. And a lot of people just get told to watch this magical girl show, even if they have no background in magical girl shows at all. So you get people who kind of had this idea of what a magical girl show is, and that's the extent of it, right? People uh, have only seen an episode of Cardcaptor Sakura or Sailor Moon on Toonami when they were 10, uh, and now they're told to watch Madoka because, oh, it, it's a dark magical girl show, you'll like it, because it's not like the normal magical girl shows. Uh, and these people uh, who don't have a background in it, and probably many of you guys, if you, you know, watch Madoka, um, but not Cardcaptor Sakura, you would, you, would have, you would think of this, or you would think of this, right? Transformation stock sequences, and they fade out, and they're, you know, silhouettes, and, or like monster of the day battles, where it's low stakes, and the heroines are never gonna lose, ne there's never really a threat, right? Um, and you come into Madoka Magic with that in mind. And the sad part, kind of about Madoka Magica, is that it works best as a genre show. And we've got a lot here to talk about in regards to how it effectively assimilated the database for, Mado for Magical Girls, reshaped it, and used it to further its goals in storytelling. So before we talk about the shows that missed the mark of what Madoka did, we have to look back, and we have to see, like, why Madoka was so effective. So you, you, the protagonist waking up from a dream in the first episode. Literally what Nanoha does, literally what Park Captor Sakura does, like, you've seen it again and again and again, and even, like, on a more fundamental level, like, shots, basic shots, like, that into that, and, and I don't know, I saw that, and I was like, oh, it's like the Park Captor Sakura first episode, and, and in the dream sequence, and I think that it's clear that they're obviously invoking things like that, and, jeez, this is the biggest smoking gun, um, the ribbon that they give, Madoka gives to Homer in the last episode is literally just the end of Lyrical Nanaha's first season. Um, and, you know, Akiyuki Shimbo directed both of these, so it's not, it's not like that. Um, the thing, though, is that it's so concise in what it does, Madoka Magica. It has a purpose. And um, structurally, yes, but also thematically. So I want, I want, this is a quote from Gen Urobuchi, Urobuchi, sorry, who wrote Madoka Magica. And he says, For me, I had this image of General Maho Shoujo work should have a family properly portrayed. In that sense, it can be said that Madoka's family, including her mother, are characters I forced myself to come up with, since usually in my works, family almost never appeared. And contrary to Madoka, there is absolutely no description of a family in Homer's case. And it's because she is a character who is not needed to be taken as a symbol for Maho Shoujo. And it is not that there is some reason that she must not have a family, but it's because there is no need to depict them so they do not appear. Conversely, for Madoka, the family must be depicted. And this is like the biggest possible evidence that um, one, Madoka Magica was written with like purpose and concise um, efficacy in mind. And then also that Gen Urobuchi and Akiyuki Shimbo were totally aware that they were making a magical girl show and that they needed to use the things that you identify with a magical girl show in order to talk about that. One of, one of the common complaints, um, and you know, that even extends to exactly the words they use, the hero of justice, right? Uh, you know? Um, one of the common complaints I hear from Madoka Magica is that they don't get to spend the time with the characters, uh, they don't get to know them, um, and there's no like small moments or slice of life 
aspect that lets you grow attached to them. Like, there would be a magic, traditional magical girl show. And, yeah, there isn't. Um, because the show is specifically structured to remove all of that, and it assumes it from the database at large. And when you, when you hear them say, I want to be a hero of justice, you are to already know of the hero of justice and what that means from things like Sailor Moon and other magical girl shows. And the conceit of Madoka Magica, and the, the bit that makes it interesting is that it continuously denies the, the happiness or the catharsis. Um, it keeps you captive to, to the, uh, the spiral downwards, if you will. Um, and I think this is so evident in a number of areas, but the, the biggest one for me is episode nine, when Kyoko is going, she has the idea that she's going to redeem Sayaka and she's gonna change her back from being a witch and she's gonna, you know, make her normal again. And God, they put in a line that literally says, It'd be like one of those stories where love and courage defeat everything, right? And <laughs> this is not only the character, you know, she goes on to say, I became a magical girl because I loved stories like those. Um, and if you play actually the PSP game, Mommy, and you do Mommy's Root, she has the exact same thing. If like, I remember watching those stories on TV and um, I became a magical girl because of them. So it's it, clearly invoking it, but it's also like, imbuing it in the viewer that you, along with Kyoko, should expect Sayaka's redemption in episode 9 to work. You should be feeling that. And this is not the first time, it's, it's probably the climax of those, um, the, the episode where I'm most expecting the turn to come, but even things like the first episode Madoka doesn't become a magical girl. That's transgressive to the genre as a whole because in every other first episode of a magical girl show, you have the, t the eponymous character become a magical girl. And again and again, the show denies it. You think that when, you know, mommy says, oh, let's be magical girls together, that would be amazing, wouldn't it, Madoka? In episode three, you think, oh, that's okay, this is when it's gonna go back on the rails. Um, or you think that's, you know. Um, and again and again, it just doesn't. And it just uh, refuses to go there. And one that's to, you know, obviously challenge the genre conventions and deny that catharsis to make it an entertaining drama, but it's, too, it's played out in the story because of Homer's actions. Literally what she does is refuse to make Madoka Magica a normal magical girl show. And that's kind of why Madoka is kind of not really that much of a character, because she doesn't really need to be a character. She just needs to be an embodiment of the traditional magical girl shows and um, Homer keeping her under lock, lock, um, lock step, lock step, yeah, is, um, is, is the entire point. But here's the thing, like denying the catharsis, right? Or, or, you know, putting some darkness in front of your heroines and saying, you know, you, you have to overcome this, or this is the challenge here. Like, that's not transgressive, that's not something novel. Magical girls always did that. They, they were always dark. Uh, in any third-rate fanfic author could tell you that to make your to build up to these lofty ideals, you need to challenge the characters with the opposite of that. You need to force them to prove what they're doing and that they have faith in their worldview and what they believe in. So again and again in magical girl shows, you'll see the climaxes, or, or you know, once you get out of the slice of life stuff, and once you get into the more plot heavy stuff, you'll see these types of situations. And for example, in this scene, you know, it's uh, at the end of Sailor Moon season one, and you know, everyone, her friends are all dead, and she's all alone, and she has to, uh, you know, fighting doesn't work, so she has to trust and believe that the glamour of her past life, the love there, that it meant something to her, and that it would mean something to Endemion as well. And, and you see it again and again. This is a bad screenshot, but it's from uh, Princess Tutu's mid-season climax. 
And it, like, the, again, and where her mentor is burning in the background. And it, it, again, it's terrible, painful choices. And the show is riddled with these. It's not the only example. And I think the, the misconception is that little girls are, they're more resilient and they understand quite well like social, political, emotional, and even existential threats to themselves and those that they love. And that's not, you know, pain and, uh, and hardship is not something you can't s show to children. Um, this one's, it's pretty obscure, um, but it's a great example of how magical girl shows always were dark in content. This is Mickey Momo. Uh, it's a show before Sailor Moon and before the genre really got codified. Um, Mickey Momo dies midway through her, her series, like literally gets hit by a truck and literally dies. Uh, she gets reincarnated or uh, as a like a baby and stuff for the rest. It's weird, but it, like <laughs> she. It, it, just for the pure shock value thing, right? It's, that's not that's not new, or or something like this of like um, Naru or Molly, if you watch the original dub, um, pulling the thorns out of Nephrite in in episode twenty three of uh, Sailor Moon or twenty two. Um, this this is a powerful moment because it's you know it's inflicting the pain. She's getting shocked. She's getting uh, feeling the physical burden of this. But she's also doing it to save a bad guy, or to help a bad guy that she believes in and she loves him. Um, so when you have pain, this physical pain and physical violence, and you stick it in the context of proving the themes or having the heroines prove what they value, then yeah, it totally works. Oh, and here's a clip. And you may remember this one. one of the climatic scenes from Revolutionary Girl Utena. Um, and yeah, it's not, there's no illusion or anything there that's anti-suicide scene. And, um, man, I, I think you could make an argument there that maybe Revolutionary Girl Utena skews a little older, or that it's, you know, not representative of a traditional magical girl show, and I agree, but, like, the drama that she's going through is, or the pain, the internal suffering, is representative in stuff like Pure Moonlight on Sailor Saturn. Um, and these characters going through things and, and suffering, it's the whole, like, their whole story. That's the, the whole concept of the character. Um, or even if you don't want to go for emotional or physical damage, uh, think about something like uh, card Captor Sakura in, in the battle against Yue or the erase card when when things that she values uh, her relationships to other people are inherently threatened and it's played out to be a horrific thing um, and yeah I don't know I, you could I could sit here for days and list these all off examples of traditional magic girl, girl shows being dark but my favorite from this year is Lulu Amor from Hubto Precure which just aired and she goes through this whole litany, a whole gambit of just everything kind of savage, like learning emotions, like, you know, dealing with a, her father being a, you know, a jerk, uh, working with the bad guys. And that's all, it wouldn't feel out of place on like a Netflix or HBO original drama. And it's all in what you would call a traditional magical girl show. It's, and you know, one of the cliche things is that it's only in the face of danger can you be brave, right? But so too does like fundamental meaning and uh, empowering the values that are inherent to the magical girl genre. And those would be like uh, compassion, love, and understanding to prove that those have meaning and that those have power. And that's what magical girl shows do again and again and again, these unrealistic things that don't 
you know, uh, rationally make sense and don't rationally uh, be something that you would want to uh, grant power. They do because the heroines believe in it and they trust in it, and that, you know, kind of fundamentally gives it its power. Um, and that's what, that's what I loved about these shows, and that's, you know, after watching a bunch of them and thinking about them again and again, I love to see that played out, and I love to see how it's played out. Now, maybe if you don't have the background, if you haven't watched 200 episodes of Sailor Moon, or like, you know, all of, all of you know, at least two series of Pretty Cure, um, then maybe you, you see something like this, right? And this moment in episode three with Mommy and, and talking to Madoka, and you see that and you kind of, okay, yeah, whatever. You know, you, you let that slide. And you, it could be understood how you would more gravitate towards this and more remember this. And that's kind of the crux of it. That's kind of unfortunate. Um, so now we're going to get into, like, the rest of everything that came after Madoka. Um, and I don't want to claim that these are all trash, or I don't want to make some broad, you know, generalized uh, superlative claim. Um, I'll stop short of saying they're without merit, but I will claim that they never ended up stumbling into something meaningful, and they never really got close to what traditional magical girl shows used their dark elements for and exactly what Madoka did. And before we go into that, actually, I kind of want to, I kind of want to start in a weird place. This is not a magical girl show, this is from Gakko Garashi. Um, but it's, has more in common with the clips we're going to see than anything else, really. And then, by that I mean it's written backwards. It's written, it, the concept of Grako Garashi, I'm just gonna spoil this for you, but if you haven't seen it, it's not a big deal. It's literally only this. The entire show is one premise, that this person has some PTSD, she has some stress symbol, or some something going on cognitively, where she can't accept the reality of a zombie apocalypse, but she instead thinks it's a daily high school life. And the show is made so that you're, you're going along in that first episode of like, oh, it's a daily high school life, but wait, you know? Um, and the, <laughs> this show is not, it has nothing else to it, like, there's nothing else there, it's just the concept, and it was, it, you can tell that it was originally conceived by just the concept of having this inversion, this one hoodwink, uh, in the first episode, and it works great as a first episode, um, but then there's nothing, there's no drama that comes out, of it, or it's not used for any thematic purpose, and I think all of these shows really fail to go forward and say, how can we pull at the taffy of the magical girl structure and ultimately, you know, uh, capitulate back and, and uh, verify the themes um, or make it a magical girl show or say something different. Um, but they start with the transgressive content and then they bumble forward onto a story. And that's what I mean by written backwards. Um, so let's go in chronological order, I think. Uh, the first one... First one we've got is Wixels. So is the worst show, but um, yeah, that 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 whole like gross. Uh, oh, let's not go there yet. But the uh, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know what to say about Wixos. It's, it's a card battling show. It's definitely in, in this genre of dark magical girl shows, and it's just like cop out. Cop out's a good word. I, 
you should watch it if you're interested in it. If that makes you interested in it, then you should watch it. What I'm saying is that that's not why I come to Magical Grocers, or that didn't make me interested in it. And it's, it feels so much like they saw the witch's labyrinth and then mixed a little giant naked ray from Evangelion in there, and they're like, yeah, that's, that's what the kids love, right? Um, and yeah, I don't know, maybe they do. They made like four seasons of that show, so maybe they do. Let's move on. This one's fun. Yeah, the organ. Just the edge. I, don't, I, I fundamentally don't like edge as a, as a concept, and oh god, this is the, literally the intro scene, the first things you see when you watch um, Magical Girl Raising Project, it came out in 2016. Um, and it was billed as kind of Magical Girl Battle Royale, and god, I really hated this show. I think this is my least favorite on this entire list. Um, because everything's a contrivance, right? Um, everything is just forcibly, you know, they have to die for there to be edgy, dark drama in the show. And that's the only reason that they, that they have to die. Uh, whereas, and I want to talk about this in relation to um, our next show, uh, Yuki Yuna is a Hero, um, in the same way, like, why do things have to happen? Or for what purpose is your dark drama used? And if you think about, like, why something like Sayaka, Sayaka turns into a witch in Madoka Magica? And it's because she can't reconcile her ideals and, and why she made her witch with uh, who she's become and the, and the reality of it. She can't, uh, she doesn't have the mindset that Kyoko does. Um, she, she fails at her, her value system and her, um, you know, what makes her operate. She can't find a purpose. And I think in both Magical Girl Raising Project and Yuki Yuna, I don't think that's ever an issue. I think all the drama is external, and that they, the girls in Yuki Yuna get disabled um, over the course of the show, and I, don't, I never really saw it attached to anything that the girls did themselves. Um, it was just happened to them, because being a magical girl sucks. Um, but I... It, in all of these, being a magical girl can indeed suck, and you see, like, the first episode of Sailor Moon, Usagi's looking at the, the thing of Sailor V, like, oh man, it'd be real great to be a magical girl, wish I was a magical girl, and then in the, you know, at the end, she's, she's like, crying, is like, this is terrible, I hate this. Um, but they, they do that for a reason. Um, if you have it, if you have it to challenge the heroes, internal, then it's worthwhile. Uh, I don't know, Yuki Yuna is not bad, it's just the most Madoka clone, so if you're, if you're into that and can stand it, sure. Um, here we go, Magical Girl Sight, here we go, this is the intro. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you.